Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 98. My name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And Lindsay. Hello. And we're back counting down my top 100 games of all time. We're in the top half. So disregard all the garbage games from the last two episodes. This is the good stuff. Yeah, all those other games that only made the top 100 as opposed to the, you know, (laughs) other 10,000 board games that exist. Yeah. I think looking at... Looking at the whole list, I think this segment is actually my favorite. Obviously not my favorite games, but I like the variety and there's a lot of games on here that could move up or down significantly over time. Whereas the top 25, a lot of those games, like, you know, they're kind of locked in and it's going to be hard for other games to beat them. This one still has got a lot of movement potential. And indeed, there was a lot of movement on the list from the previous years. We've got games that moved up as high as 28 spots and down as far as 24 spots. Really? Huh. Which is hard to do because we're in the top 50. So that's surprising. Anyways, we'll talk about that game when we get to it. So yeah, let's get started. We finished off at 51 last time. That was 1822 CA. Number 50 in almost the same place it was last year is Seven Wonders Duel. Which, uh, actually, I believe since last list, I played way more games of online, which usually means it'll move up or down when that happens, but it hadn't. But I played a, there was a good couple of weeks where I was playing Seven Wonders Duel uh, almost every day and then wrote a strategy guide about it. Fun fact, I own two copies of this game and have yet to play it. You own two copies and have not played it. How and I've not own, played it yet. How do you own two copies? So I bought it. For myself because mm-hmm. i was like oh i'm always looking for good two-player games i heard really good things about this i think from the internet actually not you for, for the first time ever and then i bought it and then it was right around christmas time and then my parents also know that i like two-player games and then got me seven wonders duel so i actually re-gifted it to my roommates but they were not my roommates yet so and then um, they became your roommates it, and brought the game and then they them. became my roommates that I bought for them. So like it came back into my life and now I sort of have two copies again. So it's, yeah, dual, no it has a dual presence in my life. You should, you should play it. You should play it again. I know yourself. I want to, I really want to, I just haven't done it yet. It's really cool. It's got a, it's got some fun stuff in there. The military and science victories are much more viable than I initially thought after playing it online. And they are legitimate threats to win the game. Uh, which which I think is pretty neat because I think a lot of games would put that in there just to kind of rein in play but wouldn't actually have it as a legitimate threat. It's really cool. I like it. Next, moving up 18 spots from last time, Roll for the Galaxy in number 49. The best loud game. Which, it's uh, the best. It's so good. Moved up, I think, just because we played it. Like, it, it got played. Uh, it's one we pull out a lot because it takes like 20, 30 minutes and can be played with lots, you know, up to five people. And we all know how to play, so it gets it gets played a lot. Moving up 26 spots, and I had no idea this wasn't up in this zone from last list. Uh, but moving up 26 spots, a distant plane. Oh, have you Which, even played this since the last list? No, but I guess it's it's improved in my mind. Huh. Yeah, I like it a lot. The distance I mean, has made you fonder. You know, we, we we had that project where we were running through all of the coin games in order. And it did feel like a distant plane was where coin like figured itself out. That's where yeah, there was a clear step up between Cuba Libre and distant plane. And yeah, it's actually it was. It also helps that it's a conflict I know a little bit more about than the other conflicts. Um, so there was there mm-hmm. were more names that were familiar in like places and stuff because. Yeah, it's a conflict I actually lived through. Good. Well, compared to the first first two games, you knew yeah, I don't know it. much about those uh, revolutions. I know about the Afghanistan war, and then the rest, like, yeah, I don't know Vietnam that well. I don't know Gaul that well. Yeah, a lot. Of, every other coin conflict, I don't really know that well. Like I said before, a lot of gamers who are into war games and historical games are really into history, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm like into historical games, but I'm not that much of a historian. I I don't care that much. So I don't know. That makes me, I think that makes me odd compared to to most uh, historical gamers. I enjoy history, but I don't actively study it. 
You you know a lot more about it than I do. That's for sure. I, I studied a lot more in school, but since then, uh, well, I, I don't know. I guess I've listened to some of the hardcore history, which is great, but mm-hmm. I don't go out of my way to read history books or anything like that. Yeah, I read a lot of biographies. So I read a lot of like, like I do read like biographies that have history involved in them. Mm-hmm. So, but I like a lot of like, um, I like it's more recent history. So I would say like things from like the, the 50s and on since since but, 2000 wow. so in the last 22 yeah, years <laughs> i'm gonna say books i have a slightly higher threshold of like history from 1950s and later so depending on the archetype or you know i can i can i have That's a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of wiggle yeah. room mm-hmm. okay. That, okay. That, that one makes a little more sense they both make perfect sense i'm confused <laughs> Yeah, people from, I don't remember which episode it was of the last two, but people on the Discord channel were shocked furious. and appalled by Lindsay's they were fast and uh, furious, yeah. old movie bias, which, uh, good for them. Yeah, as they should. <laughs> Moving down 22 spots, I think because I haven't played it, is Tack, which is still my highest mm. abstract game, like purely abstract or at least that style of game. Well, eh, kinda. Um, depending on how you define abstract, my it's still my favorite of the of the modern abstracts. I think Tack is very, very good. And I was actually thinking about how I evaluate abstract games. And the hard part as a reviewer with abstract games is that the best abstract games reveal themselves over like hundreds and hundreds of plays, but you can't sit there and spend years playing hundreds of times to review every abstract game that comes across so you have to kind of take a guess at its strategic depth and i end up i think evaluating it by how fun it is to kind of figure out the game so you know going from a complete novice to feeling like i figured out some stuff if a game can give me that in its you know first 10 to 20 plays then i end up liking it and tack has a very good kind of strategic learning curve in that sense after your first handful of plays you start noticing some stuff which is i think why i like it so much number 46 a game i'm going to play later this week by the time this is published i will have played it again uh is dune oh did you actually who'd you end up playing that with some you're gonna play it at g2s people i know and people i don't know and amber at g2s yeah nice. Oh, nice. which is the last time i played it was the last g2s that was one of the last times i played games in public <laughs> yeah I was like right before the pandemic hit hard. Yeah. Before we really knew. So that was one of the last, yeah, one of the last conventions. I, I think PAX East was after it. And that was my last convention before pandemic times. But yeah, Dune. The original Dune. I mean, it could be the, I'm, I'm playing the new printing of it, but not Dune Imperium, I would like to point out. Because Dune Imperium is the game that everyone knows about. It's not that one. That one did not make my list. I don't know. This why is the one. This thinks, is the Dune that we played. Right? This is the. Up to five to six hour long, six player yeah. epic game by a the symmetrical guys. symmetrical game yeah. that could end on any of the ten turns. Yeah, made by the guys who made uh, Cosmic Encounter. Mm-hmm. Much better than Cosmic Encounter. Yes, better than Cosmic Encounter, but also better than Dune Imperium. I don't understand why everyone is in love with that game so hard. I don't get it. I think it's a very good game. I don't understand why it's rising to be like, I think it's like number five on Board Game Geek. Isn't it? Is it just, is it just the new I hotness? I was wondering how much of an intersection these games have with Board Game um, It's the new hotness, but Geeks. I don't understand. It is, okay, it's not that high. It's number 15 on Board Game Geek. Holy moly, Twilight Struggle's down to 13. Back when I entered the hobby, Twilight Struggle was number one on Board Game Geek. Back in my day, they put good games at the top of the list. <clears throat> Just kidding. I think Gloomhaven's still number one, so. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Gloomhaven's great. Yeah. Anyways, I I, I, I got to figure out this Dune Imperium thing. I don't I don't understand it. It's it's pretty, it's, it's a good game, but it's not that special. Anyways, Dune is a very fun game. It's quirky and weird and bananas, just as you would expect from the Cosmic Encounter guys, but it's a little more serious and uh, brings you into the feeling of Dune. It's my favorite Dune property. (laughs) I liked it a lot better than the books. Number 45 is a silly sci-fi game that's actually better than Cosmic Encounter. That's Sidereal Confluence. Yeah, this one is is so good. This one is definitely on my. Although it dropped twenty four spots games. from last time, 
Can Ooh. I offer you some cubes for your cubes? Yeah. I just actually wrote an article about trade economic principles in Sidereal Confluence, which I quite like, but I don't think anyone read. So there you go. Sidereal's good. And they apparently actually made a printing that doesn't look like garbage. So I'm kind of tempted to pick up the new version and sell my old version, but I probably shouldn't. That'd be silly. Continuing on with the coin games, this is going to be the list of coin games. We've got Falling Sky which, again, I, I know less about historically, but I do find the dynamics in Falling Sky between all the different factions to be very, very fun, especially when you have one faction that just steamrolls <laughs> over and over everyone else with the uh, the Romans. Yeah, it's got this... It's like a wave. You know, the Romans are just kind of unstoppable wave, and they go in and then they recede back, and they crash in and recede back, and everyone else is just trying to balance up against that, which I, I find to be a very fun dynamic. It's also one of the shorter coin games, too, which is also nice. 43, Sprawlopolis. Interesting. Which, uh... I don't know. Well, I like I like this game a lot, but I don't know if I would put it in, in a top... In a top hundred games, honestly. Really? Mm-hmm. My favorite, my favorite wallet game, my favorite wallet game? micro game. What it does with eighteen cards is pretty incredible. Actually, that's a good point. Like, I think of the games that you could carry in your wallet, and which I feel like there are plenty of times where it comes in handy to have that. This would be the one that I would go to, and so I guess for that reason, that that makes it deserve that deserves for it to be in the top one hundred for what it does for what yeah, it is. I mean, it's. As like a solo game or even like a co-op, I think it works best with like one or two players. If you get more players, it works fine with higher player counts. And honestly, there's not, you can, I think it goes technically up to four, but you could easily go to five or six people. It wouldn't be as fun because you'd have a, like four turns in the game. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's got a lot of, it's, it's you know, it's, it's one of those co-op games that's really a solo game. You can just share the turns between people, which is a lot of co-op games. I, I really like Sprawlopolis. I've been tempted to run through every single permutation. Someone did that. It's like I think it's like 500-something different setups you can have of scoring. And someone went through. He'd do like one or two a day. And after a year or two, uh, he was done, which seems fun. I would like to do that. Number 42 is Zulkin, the Mayan calendar. Stayed in the exact same spot as last year, which just wow. just like... The forces of chaos alone shouldn't happen very much, but it's a very, very... You like this game exactly as much as you did two years ago, relative to every other game that you've played? Really, if it doesn't move (laughs) any spots, it means I liked it slightly more, because there are games that, I guess there aren't many, but there are games, you know, new games it's fighting against, right? There's a bigger pool, so if it doesn't drop, it, uh, it's actually kind of an improvement. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but in terms of like mid-weight, like straight down the middle resource conversion Euro games, it doesn't get much better than Zulkin. It does feel, it has that like tightness to it that like Agricola has, the meanness to it. You know, I'll be a little bit hesitant to pull it out if I want something a little more relaxing, but in that category of mid-weight Euro games, I, I think it's fantastic. It also looks super cool. All the gears and stuff, it's good stuff. Plus there's a strategy called Big Corn big corn which is actually very fun to pull off all right now we're getting to a couple of the games that moved up a lot i think because of the pandemic because i got to play them and because they are nicer on the brain uh number 41 lost cities which i just released a video about actually which is just great it's fantastic it's light two players i i'm now beating amber at it in our global rankings uh, even though she's still, to Amber? <laughs> she still insists that she's better at it than I am, but I finally passed her in the win loss counter uh, after after I got severely unlucky in the first couple of matches. Uh, I've now surpassed her, and uh, she still insists she's better at the game than I am. But I, I don't think that's true. I did move up to the top ten. I think I was like third in the board game arena rankings at one point, Ooh. which I was pretty proud of, especially for a game with so much like luck factor involved. You know, you're even the best players are going to win like, you know, 55 to 60 percent of the time. I was I was pretty happy with that. Number 40 is for sale. Wow, for sale is so Little good. Auction game. It is excellent. Oh, these are also games, by the way, Lindsay. 
for sale was released in 1997. So 1997. Your entire, whew, and your I entire still world like is shattered. Okay. Everything is because I love for sale. So this is this is I feel like what you have to do with me is you have to show you have to show something to me and then I don't tell me anything about it. And then I'm like, sure. You like but Catan, if I right? like, am able to Google it or look it up. No, I actually don't, don't like, like Catan because okay. we were talking about this yesterday because I don't like because it's a king making game. I like I like Catan, Catan, Settlers, whatever with the right people with like certain sure. type with certain people. But I feel like most people know. I like Catan as a role playing game more than a competitive game. <laughs> <laughs> interesting well it's more fun when you just like pretending to build your little civilization instead of like i'm going to be the most efficient person to getting to 10 points and then everyone teams up on you when you get to eight or nine points or you're like counting everyone's cards and you're like oh well they could have two victory points and if they get longest road then i have to do this only to block them which like i get the strategy i just don't find it in in enjoyable in that game yeah Mm -hmm. yeah there was actually a, a Someone was. I saw something on Twitter. There was some article someone wrote about how they were trying to pitch that Catan's a really bad game to introduce people to. Which I don't even like Catan that much, but I disagree with that. It's a perfectly fine game to like for like non gamers. Everyone was getting really mad at that article. <laughs> yeah, Catan's fine, but for sale is is magnificent. It's an auction game that really hones in that aspect of just trying to guess trying to guess what someone else is going like someone else's bidding threshold and just squeaking in on the margins around that threshold. That's like the entire game. So it, it often goes spectacularly wrong because you have, if you're just slightly wrong on this thing that has a, you know, huge wide probability space, uh, then you fail. So I don't know. It taps into something with, with the auctions that I really like. And I do love auctions. I didn't find that I enjoyed for sale. Like it's probably one of my right least favorite now. auction games that we've played a bunch of times. It just feels too arbitrary or something. Yeah, it's the same thing I'm talking about. I think you just dislike that that dynamic and I like it quite yeah. a bit. I think you you typically dislike auctions more than I do. Yeah, you like auctions more than I do. I prefer a more deterministic strategy, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. That's okay. probably where I have the best edge in terms of playing games. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, in this game, I like I lurk only like certain types of auctions, and so this game I feel like doesn't generally work with the types of auctions that I like. So it actually doesn't really make any sense of why I like this game, but for some reason it defeats all the rules in every way. I think Is you it like it because year? it's from before two thousand. Definitely that, and that it's the only auction game that follows a certain formula that I actually enjoy. I don't know. I don't understand. Yeah, it's a good one, though. 39 is Pulsar 2849. It's a point salad game and just runs with it and has cool stuff. I love it. You get to and it's a circle. do whatever you want. You pick pick stuff and you go do it and you fly around and you plant gyrodynes, I think they're called, and capture star energy. It's it's just it's like a little playground a point salad playground. Like it's a point salad without very much tension. Uh, so it, it's, I find it very chill and uh, very, very fun. 38 is The Crew, the original. Mm-hmm. So good. It's a good one. We talked we about... So, the best we trick taker. so much of this. Yeah, Ooh. definitely. Definitely the best trick taker on, on the list. I don't know about that, but pretty close. What would you put above it, Lindsay? Uh, so I, you know how much I love fire tricks. Yeah, you know how much I love fire tricks. <laughs> oh, but fire I tricks, love yeah. it's so good. I love I love the crew. Though. Like that's not saying that the crew is bad. I'm not saying screw you to the crew. Do enjoy this one. I like pirate tricks, but I also you know it's like half an auction game and half a trick taking game, so it doesn't feel like a complete one of either necessarily. Sure. Right, like you only get to do three hands of trick taking in like a forty minute game, so or thirty minute game, so it feels like you're missing something on both ends. Uh, as much as I do like that one, but the crew is is just magnificent. It's almost like a not a critique. What am I thinking of? It, it's like a deconstruction of trick taking by making it cooperative. It forces you to look at elements of the game and strategies that you only do if you're like an advanced player in other trick-taking games. But it like okay. pushes you into those like card counting 
in understanding the implications of someone being void in a suit and the implications of a Trump suit. It, it just pushes you towards that really rapidly, which is which is why I think it's it's really brilliant. Number 37, Orion's least favorite game in the whole wide world, uh, Stevenson's Rocket. Certainly on this list. <laughs> I love it. It's basically a cube rail game, uh, and it's about putting your opponents in positions they hate where they can't do anything good and then reveling in how fun that is. Also a game from before 2000. That's, this one's from 1999. Same year as Lost Cities. Canizia was really pumping out the classics in 99. Yeah. And for the rest of his career. <laughs> and, and all the other years. Since and every other year. 1992. <laughs> He's been going for 30 years. Doesn't he have like 500 published games or something? Oh, it's over 600 now, I think. Okay. Yeah. And the last couple have been pretty heavy. Like, he doesn't have many. Most of his games are very, very light. Uh, I think his last couple of games were like medium weight games, which is, there aren't many of those. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to play them yet. They're on my list. Speaking of heavier games, 36 is PAX Premier 2nd Edition, which I got to try it at two players. I've heard it's actually decent at two players, but what a fascinating game, a fascinating look at that conflict. I've played it three or four times, I think. I still don't quite know what I'm doing strategically, but I think just the perspective it takes is really, really interesting in terms of like there's a massive conflict going on but the game is about being like the secondary players in the conflict and fighting to make yourself the strongest position out of those secondary players is is cool i think this game has to be best at three players just because of the way that three different factions work and i i don't think i played it at two either but i just it in my head it seems like it would reduce down to this tug of war situation that would be much less interesting than the three-player dynamic yeah well that's what i thought too but then i keep hearing people recommend it too not as necessarily the best but is like surprisingly good so it would let me play the game more so uh, that's all i'm saying but yeah i think it it seems like it wants three or four Mm -hmm. i'll have to give it a shot number 35 it's been in the top 50 every single time i've done the list terra mystica it's a great game it is a great game. I think we played a oh. lot of this in the, uh, the beginning in Board Game Arena. And I actually enjoy playing. Like, there's some games that I don't enjoy playing on Board Game Arena, some that I do. And I think this is one that I do enjoy playing on Board Game Arena. I enjoy it both ways. It does look really good on the table. Mm. Like, it's just a really nice looking game. I like the colors in it. I like the verticality of the board once you build all the buildings. I think it looks really cool. So I will gladly play it in person at any time. Um, I'm surprised this is this far down. It has, it's been higher in the past. Uh, last list was the highest it ever was at 23. So it only dropped 12. Okay. In the previous two lists, it was at number 40 both times, which really? I did think it was really high, like top 20 at some point, but it, it never was. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this would be in my top 20. I'd yeah, have to actually like make it. A bit I have to make a list. But yeah. yeah. I got into like figuring out all the strategy and a bit more of the metagame, I think, than you did. Um, although you also looked up a bunch of rankings and kind of thought about the relative strength of different factions. I, I spent a lot of time figuring out like how each faction is kind of supposed to develop and those starts you want to look for and things like that. Yeah. So I didn't want to, I kind of just picked the nomads and I just practiced at them a lot and I was the nomads a lot and I didn't really develop my strategy much beyond that. Uh, back when we were playing on mm-hmm. that one site, I don't remember with the tournaments, now we've got two brand new games in a row. My top two games Ooh. of 2020. At number 34 is My City, another Knizia title, uh, his legacy game. We had a blast running through this campaign. Oh, I loved it's that really cool. so much. Yeah, it's it's really chill. It was, it was the perfect timing of like, we're just coming back together after being in our separate bubbles to rebubble fly ourselves into a, a <laughs> into our game bubble and uh, we played through my city it was not too much it was fun to play multiple times in a row you know we'd blast through like eight different 
of the eight different scenarios at once. And, and we, we got through it. It's my, definitely my gift recommendation for the last couple of years. I think pretty much any group would enjoy my city. I would agree with that. I would recommend this to pretty much anyone. And I think they would all enjoy it. Is this a three plus game or four plus? Or? I think you'd play it fine at two. It's kind of a, really it's better. kind of a multiplayer solitaire thing. There's not really, there's the tiniest bit of interaction, but you're basically just trying to, uh, score the most points each round. Yeah, it's a little, it's a Tetrisy kind of thing. So you're trying to fit pieces into a board and cover up certain stuff and not cover up other stuff. But the cool thing is that because it's the legacy game, the rules slightly change and the parameters slightly change every single time. So you can never, you can never get into like a rut, positive or negative, where you like figure it out a strategy. Because the moment you do that, something will change that'll just destroy that strategy. So you're you're just constantly re reevaluating how to how to tackle the puzzle. But slightly edging it out, number 33, also from 2020, The Field of the Cloth of Gold from Hollenspiel. It's so good. <laughs> like, I had heard good things about it, but then Amber and I played it, and then we kept playing it, and we kept playing it, and man, it's good. It's very much like Stevenson's Rocket, in which you're constantly trying to put your opponent in a position where all their moves are bad. It's it's a Zugzoin game, really. It, it reminds me kind of in that way of like Hanami Koji, also Stevenson's Rocket, where most of what you're doing on your turn is not like gaining anything. It's setting up the next turn for your opponent where they're given bad options and then maybe forced to help you. And that's like the entire game. And it's like 20 minutes long and super, super, super fun. I love it. One of my favorite two-player games. I think I disliked Stevenson's Rocket. I did or, not like okay. it. <laughs> an, an, for a number of reasons. But one of the ones that I was just thinking of is that it felt like half of the strategy was just to be a dick to the other player. Not not, not a like a cutthroat, I'm going to gain something, but just I'm just going to tax you because it hurts you and I don't get anything from it. You just are worse off. And I... I think that was that was one of the things that I didn't like. Yeah. You probably wouldn't like the feel of the cloth of gold then. Maybe right. it is, I think, maybe more palatable because it's a two player game. So in two okay. player games, you know, it's all zero sum. So to me at least it makes more sense uh that you'd have a game that is all about screwing your opponent over and not actually helping you. Plus in Field of the Cloth of Gold, like I can get the critique in Stevens's Rocket because you're building track to ostensibly help you. In Field of the Cloth of Gold, half of your turn is giving your opponent a resource. So, like, you're forced to just basically do things for your opponent as part of the function of your turn. Uh, so you're trying to give them the resources they don't want and then force them into other stuff. So it's, it's a little more coherent along in, in that sense that it's definitely about everyone make, giving everyone a bad time. Number 32 is Battlestar Galactica, one of the earliest games I got... It debuted at number 17 and kind of hovered around the 20s and 30s ever since on my list. Still really good. The kind of replacement for it uh, was just released this past year, and I'm not hearing great things about it. So mm -hmm. probably won't ever play because I got I got in on, on the original, which is which is good. But you also could sell that for big money. So that's all not as option. much money, I think. OK, interesting. well, because they basically reprinted it, but with you know, Lovecraft, mm -hmm. which is far less interesting of a setting. But Battlestar Galactica is still fantastic. Love it. Number 31 is Lisboa, which it's is... A good game. Yeah, it's great. Not my favorite Vital Lacerda game, but my second favorite. I'll spoil that much. Second favorite Vital Lacerda game. Number 30, a game that kind of seems like it could have been designed by Vital Lacerda, but was not, is Pipeline which I got to get Amber into because I think it's really good at two players. Okay. Right? Isn't that what we determined is that we like two players best or was it two players we dislike? Yeah. Well. Because you can get a game of it done in two players once people know what they're doing in like 40 minutes. I think I said I liked two players more. I think because it was three we didn't like. Three feels bad because one person gets just blocked out of technology and there's yeah. nothing they can do about it. But two player, you both get a chance to go for technology and the game ended went a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Pipeline's good but stuff. It's a good game. Definitely, it feels like Lacerda in the way that you have all these overlapping systems that you kind of have to manage. Yeah, and I'm really curious. I'm getting at the, or I will have by the time <laughs> this is published, the two-player pseudo-sequel, Curious Cargo, uh, which I have been told is better than Pipeline. So I'm very curious about that. Mm. That's what two people independently have told me they liked it better than Pipeline. And they're both people who like Pipeline. So I'm very curious about that. I'm getting a used copy of it in the auction. Number 29 is the highest riser on any of these two lists. So the the whole top 50. This one has risen the most. Probably because one, we've been playing it. Bananagrams. Bananagrams. No. Oh, okay. Playing it, I haven't played Bananagrams in years. You could Actually, no. I was forced to play it. You're not forced to do it? anything. You know, peer forced, peer pressured. It was what was happening. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to be that guy. Plus, like, I now have a morbid curiosity if I'll ever enjoy a game. Hated it even more. No, we've been playing it, and it's chill and light. So you know, it's been it's moved up on the list just like Lost Cities uh in for sale uh but this one is pictomania oh it's so good it's so good this one is really high up on my list obviously my very, i always i'm always asking to play it favorite party games it's so good it's so the, the amount of frustration that i feel at the end but also the amount of fun that i'm having are an equivalent level and that's what i'm looking for yeah. in a board game yeah. To be equally as frustrated as having a wonderful time. Vlada is a genius. I love him. Picked a media is so good. But yeah, it was only at fifty seven last time. I don't I don't quite know why. Ooh. This feels this feels more correct for it. We Number- play we played a lot. I think I'm a big proponent of us spelling it out. Yeah. Then I don't complain at all. Number twenty eight is Noosefjord. And I'll throw out twenty seven is Agricola. They got right next to each other, both of the of the Uve games. Mm. The, uh, the I like New better than one, Agricola. The but... mean one and the friendly one. Yeah, what does that say about you, Mark? I don't I, I think it says that I'm mean. <laughs> or that I you like, like mean being mean games. to people. <laughs> mean games. No, I, you, 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 you it's the game for that's mean for sure. Um, I think I like News Fjord more, although I haven't really I don't understand the cards in Agricola and I've heard you say that those are really important to shaping a strategy. Well, it's kind of you just the best way to play Agricola is you draft the cards and you use those to kind of guide your strategy. That's okay. yeah. I think I like I like New Steward more. Just you know, collecting all the fish and moving them around. It's a nice so resource many management fish. game. Yeah, so many. Fish. Yeah, it's definitely on my. It's in like it's in my top twenty five for sure. Oh, cool. I really love that game. We haven't played it in a long time, but every time we played it, I have really enjoyed it and would definitely play it again. I feel like we we offered up a lot, and there's usually like one person who's like, oh, eh, "I'm not feeling it," up but all the time. I I really like it. I'm always you. Happy. You always proposed it, and for a while we played it. We must have played it like six times in six months or something. And I was like, "All right, I'm a little sick of this game." <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. There's just so many. There's so many buildings to to explore. Like it's just there you know, there's lots of variety built into the game, right? It's got that tactical thing where you're. You know, you get a new set of buildings. You got to figure out how to manage, how to work your way through it. What kind of combos you want to create? Uh, it's just, mm-hmm. which is just pleasant. It's always pleasant to work with. Last one on this list, number twenty six, is Seven Wonders, the original. Still like it a little more than Duel, although I've duet. certainly no Duel. 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 <laughs> That's code name is Duet. You're thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven Wonders yeah. is a duel. Uh, you're Maybe trying you're... to murder each other. Codenames duet, you you actually murder each other in real life after you do the duetting. Quite fair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Seven Wonders. I've gotten to the point where I I know pretty much what my heuristics are going to be in base game because I've played it now probably a couple hundred times online. It's still fun though, even though I'm kind of on autopilot mode. Um, another game where I, I managed to rise pretty high in the rankings. Uh, but with the expansions particularly the city's expansion i think is quite good and adds a lot more variety to the game so that's we'll play with i have leaders and cities and both of those are like leaders is just a smaller expansion cities changes up things a lot with only yeah, like i think one the expansion card per round so like you draft three more cards but there's a lot more variety of strategies to go for yeah you add all the mask cards and then the guilds is the extra card basically 
Yeah, and it opens up like you could do with the right combos, you can do like a heavy money strategy where you actually get a good chunk of points from having piles of money. It just opens up other avenues because in in base seven wonders, you basically you've got to go blue more science and then you need to also get something else. No, you got to go. You got to choose if you're going to go military or science. Those are resource opposite where military is almost exclusively raw resources and all the science cards require one of the specialized resources. So it's hard to do both. Um, So you typically want to pick one of those and then you got to figure out other ways, either through blue cards or yellow cards. Yellow cards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You're kind of secondary, but you got to do something in one of those. And then typically... There's like two or three tracks in base seven wonders. I've written a strategy guide, so go look it up. Basically, lower player counts, military is far more important, so you typically want to go for military. Higher player counts, science is more viable, uh, just because of the numbers, how that works out. So, But then with, with cities, with you have, there's so many other strategies you can go, and the guilds and stuff are yeah. um, just more, more ways of getting points, so you yeah. can mix and match. The hard part yeah. is the just, cities introduce introduces it like doubles the icon count. <laughs> yeah. So it's so hard to like you can't like introduce the game to people and with that. There's a bunch of weird like one off icons that Yeah. You know. But anyways, Seven but Wonders is, is great. It's a good game despite what Ben despite Ben's hatred for it. Despite Ben's hatred for it, I agree. Yeah. All right. That is the third of our four podcasts for my top 100 list. I really like this segment. Again, lots of movement up and down. The last one, there's not going to be a lot of up and down movement, although the first game didn't move up quite a bit. Wow. That got way up there. Well, you'll find out what that game is (laughs) next episode. Next time. Next week. Uh, Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com to read reviews for most of these games and other articles and videos I mentioned. Uh, you can support us at patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for social media. Please rate and review the podcast if you enjoyed it. And we'll talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.